Hi, Dr. Newman here. I'm your professor. You know this because I'm sitting uh, in front of a bunch of books and uh, I've got elbow patches on my sleeves and there's my name right there. And today, um, very briefly, I'm first going to, we're going to talk about oral formulaic poetry and alliterative verse. Let's begin. For the purpose of this uh, discussion, I'm going to focus particularly on lines um, 852 and following. This is the scene in which um, Beowulf and his retainers, that is the, the, the men who follow him and um, who serve him, and in return he gives them uh, treasure, um, are riding after the wounded uh, Grendel, pursuing him back to the marsh den, the mere where he lives. Now what strikes you as distinct about the language of, poet, of, of the poetry of Beowulf? What is the meter? What holds the line together? Well, Old English poetry was generally organized by what was called the alliterative line. And this means that every um, unit of the Old English poem was organized into an A line and a B line, and there would be a letter sound that linked the first and second half. So just a taste of what it sounded like in Old English. Thanin eft gewitan, eld gesithas. Swilcha yeung manig, of gomen watha. From mera moldga, meorem ridan. <laughs> Baroness on Blancum, fair was Beowulfus. Now, if you notice, I'm putting the highlighter over the, um, the highlighted cursor over the alliterating letter. And so, this alliteration, this linking of letters, is what is how poets organized sound. Because what distinguishes poetry from, po from prose at the end of the day is this special attention to the sound of the language for its own sake. Now you may ask, why did people tell stories in poetry? Let's look at this passage here, okay? Then away they rode, the old retainers, with many a young man following after a troop on horseback, in high spirits on their bay steeds. Beowulf's doings were praised over and over again. Nowhere, they said, north or south, between the two seas or under the tall sky, on the broad earth was there anyone better to raise a shield or to rule a kingdom. Yet there was no laying of blame on their lord, the noble Hrothgar. He was a good king. At times the war band broke into a gallop, letting their chestnut horses race, wherever they found the going good on those well-known tracks. Meanwhile, a thane of the king's household, a carrier of tales, a traditional singer deeply schooled in the lore of the past linked a new theme to a strict meter. The man started to recite with skill, rehearsing Beowulf's triumphs and feats in well-fashioned lines, entwining his words. And I like the old English here, Wurdum Rixlan. He told what he'd heard, repeated in songs about Sigmund's exploits, all of those many feats and marvels. So why did people tell stories in poetry? Well, the enduring and persuasive theory is for memory. People made poems before writing was adopted, in part because it gives language a sensory pattern, which made it easier to remember and transmit. It was by poetry that the skull, the, sh the scope, the shope, the bard, um, transmitted the foundational stories, collective wisdom, and genealogy of their people, and we have other other examples in other cultures throughout uh, the history. Um, there's Homer in 8th, 8th century um, BCE Greece, um, collecting the sort of stories and myths and legends of Greece, um, and finally transmitting them into writing. There's the Mahabharata of um, classical India, Vedic society, um, the Bhagavad Gita is part of that. Um, there are the um, uh, griots of Western Africa who could remember the genealogies of their tribes going back dozens and dozens and dozens of generations. And by giving sound pattern to um, information, 
It gives you a kind of sensory link to help you remember it. This is why when you're a child, you learn to sing the alphabet, because singing is another sensory pattern that we give to things to help us remember them. Um, Beowulf is a transitional text. It's transitional between what's called an oral literature and a written literature. So an oral, what makes it literature is that it's a prestigious form of communication and um, it's patterned, it's aesthetic, but it's um, a literature, even though it's oral, I know it's kind of a, a contradiction, but the orality of it means that it was transmitted through um, uh, like chunks that you would memorize and so the, the alliteration helped in this pattern and so did the kennings that we that I talk about in the handout the those combinations and those epithets like you know Hrothgar giver of rings you notice there's chunks that sort of recur together and these also aided the memory of the traditional storyteller who who is deeply schooled in the lore of the past and linked new themes to strict meters kennings also allowed you to say refer to the same thing using a different word, which made some flexibility in terms of providing um, alliteration and, and making your lines alliterate. Because if you had six different words for or formulas for, for man, you know, man, goma, wicht, uh, atheling, all these different Old English words, um, then you could um, find easily, more easily find a variant that would alliterate and fix the, fix, fit the strict meter of the Old English line. So uh, it gave you a sort of um, building blocks to build new tales out of. Um, another aspect of the oral poetry um, is uh, gnomic statements, and this is something we also find in a lot of traditional literature, especially oral literature and epic literature, the gnomic or the gnomic statement. Now, when I was in graduate school, I had the privilege of studying um, Beowulf. Took an entire seminar on, on Beowulf where we read the whole thing from beginning to end in Old English um, with an eminent scholar um, of Old English who now holds um, the uh, position at Oxford that was once held by the famous medievalist um, who also wrote some fiction, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. And um, so this, this old professor of mine uh, described economic statements as the art of stating the bleeding obvious. Uh, love hurts. Love heals all wounds. Um, these kind of general kind of state, uh, you know, statements, kind of fortune cookie type comments on life are scattered throughout Beowulf if you look carefully. And if you notice, they tend to begin and end sec sections. They're sort of discourse markers. Let's take a look at Beowulf's speech when um, he, as, um, when uh, Grendel's mother has come and killed one of the retainers and they thought, hey, we beat the monster, let's have a party. Oh no, there's another monster. And I love the part where there's that one dude who's like, oh yeah, that's right, I forgot, I saw two of them. And it's like, where were you? You know, the Beowulf poet's great, sometimes he's a bit crap. Anyway, let's go to Beowulf's speech. Lines 1383 and following. Beowulf fights Grendel's mother. Um, Beowulf, son of Edgetho, spoke. Why, sir, do not grieve? It is... Hold on, I'm going to underline this. It is always better to avenge dear ones than to indulge in mourning. This is a gnomic statement. For every one of us living in this world means waiting for our end. Gnomic statement. Let whoever can win glory before death. Gnomic statement. When a warrior's gone, that will be his best and only bulwark. By the way, this is an interesting uh, uh, thought. If you're if you're interested in the topic of how much this poet uh, reflects Christian values, I don't know how much Jesus talks about winning glory for death. I don't think it's a lot. Anyway, um, so arise. This, these are the gnomic statements beginning Baal's speech. So arise, my lord, and let us immediately set forth on the trail of this troll dam. I guarantee you, she will not get away. Not to dens underground, nor upland groves, nor the ocean floor. She'll have nowhere to flee to. Endure your troubles today. Bear up and be the man I expect you to be. With that, the old ward sprang to his feet and praised God for Beowulf's pledge. So I don't want this video to run too long, but that's just a small example of gnomic statements. And these are some of the, uh, the three main, I think, features that I've talked about in this video as being part of the, um, 
style of Beowulf as oral literature, as literature that was transmitted through memory for generations before it was finally written down, it includes alliterative verse and the alliterative line, the kenning or formulaic epithet, and what was the last one? Oh yeah, gnomic statements. So uh, hang on to those three and think about them as you read uh, on Beowulf. And um, we'll, uh, in the next few videos, we'll um, talk more about some of the content of the poem and less about the style, although style and content, like peanut butter and chocolate.